All right, we are about to jump into part two, cartoons number 101 to 200. One very quick thing before we get started that I didn't talk about last time. I've been seeing some disputes as to when exactly some of these cartoons came out, and even some of the cartoon order, depending on what source you look at. To remain consistent, I've mostly been using the Wikipedia article, which as far as I can tell, is using the release dates listed in A Complete Illustrated Guide to Warner Brothers Cartoons by Jerry Beck and Will Friedwald. The book is over 30 years old, so it's possible that some of these dates are now in dispute, but for our purposes, it's good enough, especially since the further in we get, the dates and ordering are going to be less and less disputed. Alright, let's just get started. Buddy's Pony Express has a weak start, but it's got some surprisingly decent animation gags, as well as the shockingly cruel glue factory joke. Buddy's not really improving as a character, but at least his cartoons aren't always completely terrible now. A Long Flirtation Walk. The first and second halves have nothing to do with each other. The song at the start is definitely decent at least, and what I ultimately thought was going to be yet another ripoff of Freddy the Freshman actually ended up becoming something genuinely funny, with the reveal that they're playing a sport where they're trying to make as many eggs as possible. I don't know why, but that idea is just hilarious. My Green Fedora. We're finally getting some of that old-school, mean-spirited Looney Tunes humor, from the opening scene of the baby intentionally crying just to spite his brother, to a wolf beating the ever-loving stuffing out of a child rabbit. And the climax is genuinely thrilling and goes on just as long as it should. That being said, the song used isn't integrated very well into the plot, and it's not really a good enough of a song to justify it being here. But granted, it's not in it for very long. This is a genuinely great short, and an underrated one too. Buddy in Africa. I mean, aside from the usage of blackface for the African villagers... This really is not the most racially insensitive cartoon of the era. Really, the biggest issue with this one is that the gags for the most part just don't land. Also, what is it with Warner Brothers characters and spanking monkeys? Buddy's Lost World. I think the makers of this cartoon owe Sir Arthur Conan Doyle an apology. Okay, okay, to be fair, it's not that bad. The bone gag was actually pretty good, some of the animation on the dinosaurs is also really good, and there is some creativity, but the pacing just still feels off for the most part, and it never really rises above marginally amusing. Into Your Dance Another of these cartoons where anthropomorphic animals try to put on a show. It starts off really weak, picks up about the halfway point with a really great and high-spirited gag, slows down again, and then ends strongly. So yeah, the real definition of a mixed bag. Buddy's Bug Hunt. Only interesting if you want to see Buddy tortured by insects. So yeah, it's worth your time. Country Mouse. I did like the character of the Grandmother Mouse. And some of the gags are alright, specifically the tree punching gag. And the ending. But there's not really enough time to develop the plot in the way that it should be developed. Buddy Steps Out. I don't even get what the point of this one is. Cookie's bird escapes into the cold, while a photograph of Buddy just comes to life and he helps warm the bird back up. This could barely be called a plot, and there's almost no gags. I don't get it. This one's just baffling. The Merry Old Soul. I think the moral of this story is that if you're going to jump into a marriage, always, always, always check and see if they have three dozen kids before you do. Also, he's a king. Why is he moving into a shoe instead of the family moving into the castle? I guess it's just one of life's great mysteries. Buddy the G-Man. Buddy's final cartoon. And it's so bizarre that his final cartoon is not only genuinely good, but also an indictment of the prison industrial complex. No doubt made in response to the 1932 film I'm a Fugitive from a Chain Gang. There's also some really good subtle gags in here, from the warden's name to the detail of barely legible writing on the prison doors. Warner Brothers may have given us a totally bland protagonist, but they at least had the decency to send him out on a high note. The Lady in Red. It starts out pretty strong, 
with the images of roaches taking on a kind of suburbia feel, and it has some solid gags, before it quickly devolves into more stuff we've seen before, singing at a nightclub and a forced climax where the guy has to save the girl. It's not done bad, it's just, we've seen all this before. The Cartoonist Nightmare. Definitely the best of the bunch so far, and the first truly great Looney Tunes cartoon. This cartoon walked so that Duck Amuck could soar. In all seriousness, the gags are great, the timing on the slapstick is pretty impeccable, and the premise is outstanding. While there have been cartoons before this that were pretty good, this is the first real sign of life for what's to come in the future. Little Dutch Plate, your typical bland Mary Melodies cartoon with your typical bland story, but with one utterly bizarre ending that must be seen to be believed. Hollywood Capers. This is basically just a bunch of self-referential Hollywood jokes, before climaxing with a rampage of a Frankenstein robot. Honestly, it's not as much fun as it sounds. Also, Beans is definitely a step above Buddy for what was supposed to be their starring character, but he is still a little bland. Gold Diggers of 49. Tex Avery's first directing job, and right away you can tell something is different. It's kind of difficult to explain, but the timing, the pacing, the gags feel like something that's a lot closer to what we would think of as a Looney Tunes cartoon compared to what's preceded it. Now, it's not completely polished, one shot in particular is held on for too long, and the pacing isn't perfected by any stretch, but this is a definite step in the right direction. Billboard Frolics contains both the first usage of Merrily We Roll Along and an instance of a black cat trying to eat a yellow canary. That makes this one pretty prophetic cartoon. Otherwise, this is just yet another one of those inanimate objects come to life cartoons that's marginally enjoyable but is low on substance. Flowers from Madame. Okay, these dancing flowers are clearly topless, right? I'm not the only one who sees it, right? Okay, anyway, this is more bouncy fluff that, on its own, is probably alright, but when viewing these cartoons in rapid succession becomes mind-numbing. I Wanna Play House. This one's just cute, and I don't mean that in a cloying way. I like the two bear cubs, and there's a few decent gags in here, like the sandwich gag. Nothing great, but it's extremely bearable. No, I will not apologize for that pun. The Phantom Ship. This one's almost okay. The premise is alright, Beans is just fine here, and even his two nephews, Ham and X, are actually alright, believe it or not. But the editing and shot composition just feels very off, especially in the climax. The Cat Came Back. A cute little tale of an unlikely friendship, but is it me, or is it weird seeing a cat and a mouse being literally the same height? I don't know, that's really trippy if you ask me. Boom Boom. It's mostly just a series of utterly forgettable wartime gags. And with the threat of World War II just around the bend, there is something unintentionally haunting in knowing that many of the people who first saw this in the audience back in 1936 would go on to see the horrors of the front line for themselves in just a few years. Page Miss Glory. An oddly beautiful bit of anarchic cartoon chaos. The backgrounds here are so stylized and modernistic, and at times it feels like a piece of art that's come alive, and the animation is stunningly fluid. There's not a ton of gags in this one, but it more than makes up for it with its style. Alpine Antics. It's mostly a bunch of recycled gags, and with timing and pacing that just feels completely off. It's still got some amusing moments, but this is distinctly unpolished. The Fire Alarm. Ham and X are... slightly less tolerable here. With a lot of these, it feels like the joke should be landing, but the timing of the slapstick just doesn't hit like it should. The Blowout. The first real knockout Looney Tunes. This cartoon is just hilarious. The first time I saw this, I was laughing so hard that I was almost crying. The way it builds up the premise is pure brilliance, as at first it almost seems like it's made up of two seemingly disparate plots, but then they converge in such an ingenious way that I didn't see coming, which just makes the ending punchline all the funnier. 
This one isn't particularly well known, but it definitely deserves more recognition. I'm a big shot now. It's overall a pretty solid chase cartoon, even if the fact that they have to shoehorn a song near the beginning means there's not enough time to develop it properly. Westward Woe. Beans' final cartoon, and unfortunately he does not go out on a high note like Bosco or Buddy, but instead goes out on one of his worst cartoons. A pretty lackluster retelling of The Boy Who Cried Wolf, all things considered. It doesn't even seem like this cartoon is trying to have any gags until the last minute and a half or so. Plain Dippy. Very enjoyable. The chalkboard gag was pretty funny, as was the machine gun gag. Tex Avery just seems to have a talent at building gags on top of each other in a way that the other directors just don't yet. Let It Be Me. At the very least, this cartoon gets bonus points for taking a shockingly cruel turn, but it's not really enough to overcome its inherent staleness. Maybe this cartoon is supposed to be an indictment of how those in the entertainment industry are shallow and it breeds shallowness even among their fans, but that's probably me looking way too deeply into this. I'd love to take orders from you. Hey, just because Tex Avery has already directed the first genuinely fantastic Looney Tunes cartoon, that doesn't mean that he's flawless. Case in point, this bizarrely low-key cartoon that doesn't even have that many gags in it. I guess if you're looking for a cartoon with a somewhat comforting vibe, this one could do the trick, but it's devoid of pretty much anything else interesting. Fishtails. I think we're finally starting to see Porky come out as something pretty close to his modern personality, being the doormat or butt monkey to those around him. Also, Porky somehow manages to sink a battleship in a really good solid moment. Bingo Crosbyanna. It's passable enough, but there's nothing here that you can't see done better elsewhere, although the ending fight with the spider has some good solid slapstick violence that more than makes up for its lackluster opening. Shanghai Shipmates. There's not a ton of gags this time around, but I like the story, and I think there's something in having Porky Pig as the main character in these shorts that just automatically makes them better. He may not be perfect, but he is so much more interesting and fun to watch than Bosco, Buddy, and Beans. When I you who Well, there's this rifle gag. Yeah, I'm not even going to touch that one. Oh, and this cartoon ends with a cockfight. I don't know, I guess it's kind of amusing, but not consistently. Porky's Pet. This cartoon has basically the exact same premise as Mr. Mouse Takes a Trip, but it predates it by a good four years. Well, that's interesting. It's probably the most interesting thing about this, which is overall kind of bland, aside from one gag where Porky literally cuts off his pet ostrich's tail. I love to sing a. Probably the first truly iconic Looney Tunes cartoon. And what's interesting is that on paper, this doesn't really seem all that unique, but its execution is really something else, and it all culminates in an ending that's really nice and sweet. This is a spoof that's so good that even if you have not seen the movie that this is parodying, The Jazz Singer, this is still entertaining and comprehensible all on its own. Also, that main song is just so absurdly catchy, and unlike other Merry Melodies, it's integrated into the plot perfectly. I wouldn't call it funny per se, but it is insanely charming, and sometimes that's all you need. Porky the Rainmaker. It may take a bit too long on the setup, but the second half featuring the animals eating the weather pills was a lot of fun to watch, with some real creative and unique animation gags. Sunday go to meetin' time. The second of the infamous Censored Eleven, and yeah, I can't pretend to not see why. I mean... Just look at the character designs, for goodness sake. But after watching the horribly offensive Going to Heaven on a Mule, which has more or less the same premise, I've actually found a deeper appreciation for this one than I had originally given credit for. Oh, sure, there are some jokes that lean heavily into black stereotypes, but for one, a lot of them are very blink and you miss it gags, and two, the characters aren't really mocked because of their skin color, but it actually seems like an honest attempt at portraying a black community in a warm and positive light, 
as they're all good, honest, church-going folks who just enjoy being around each other. Honestly, for the 1930s, this is actually nowhere near as offensive as it could have been. And in some areas, not all, but in some areas, it actually feels rather ahead of its time. But, I mean, yeah, this still isn't great as there is some unneeded filler in the beginning, but the aesthetic and design of Hell is stellar. All the music is tap-dancingly good, and there's even some good one-liners in here. Like when Nicodemus is being forcibly dragged to church, he complains, uh, church will be there next week. There's some good stuff in here. Like I said, I'm not going to pretend to understand why people can't get into this either. I guess take all that for what it's worth. Porky's Poultry Plant. The first Frank Tashlin cartoon. And he actually makes a really good, solid first impression. Now, granted, the first half of the cartoon is pretty dull and uninspired, but once the second half hits, it's a non-stop thrill ride, with some stellar-for-the-time flying scenes, and it even manages to work in some shockingly dark and cruel jokes in here. At your service, madame. A widow lets a W.C. Fields caricature into her house and flirt with her, despite the fact that he is a clear and obvious gold digger. The climax is fine, but nowhere near as hard-hitting as it could have been. Porky's Moving Day The woman's about to lose her house to the sea, and her first thought isn't to call, I don't know, the fire department or an ambulance or anything like that. Instead, she calls a moving company to get her stuff out of the house, because priorities, I guess. Anyway, this one's got some good gags, the chimney one being the highlight of the whole thing. Toy Town Hall This is a clip show. Literally more than half of this cartoon's animation is taken from somewhere else, and the wraparound segment is not engaging enough to justify it. That is a special kind of lazy. Milk and Money. A really good, fun time with some great gags. The animation on Mr. Viper in particular is fantastic, and it helps give a lot of personality to what's ultimately a one-off gag character. The milk delivery scene doesn't really amount to much, but... We did get some good gags out of it, so it's not really a total loss if you don't mind me saying so. Boulevardier from the Bronx. It's mostly just a bunch of lackluster baseball gags, and if you've already read Casey at the Bat, you already know how this is going to end. Don't look now. Seems like Tex Avery's attempt at making something cute, but of course his more cynical side shines through, and it's all the better for it. Little Bo Porky. Misses the perfect opportunity for a Three Little Pigs joke. But in all seriousness, this one's really good in spite of a bit of a rough start. The Cuckoo Nut Grove. This one's, I guess, interesting as a historical artifact. Like, if you want to know which Hollywood celebrities were popular at the time. But, honestly, if you don't know who these people are, and I suspect most of you don't, a lot of these gags and references are going to be lost. The Village Smithy. The narrator has a lot of personality in this one. And the rubber horseshoe gag is fun and gets a surprising amount of mileage out of it. Porky in the Northwoods. This one has a really good balance of really cruel moments while ultimately having a really sweet center. Some of the juxtaposition is a lot of fun. Like the sign in Porky's log cabin that reads, Love thy neighbor, just as the villain is about to start pummeling him. The introduction to the villain is absolutely stellar as he gleefully breaks every single rule on the forest signs in the most over-the-top manner possible. I wouldn't call this funny per se, but it's a well-developed story with a climax that's equal parts satisfying and entertaining. He Was Her Man Has a good start as it really helps you sympathize with the poor wife and her plight, but in the end it kind of gets undercut by the fact that she tries to win him back. Why? He's an abusive, cheating, worthless bum with absolutely nothing to offer. Like, I get that it's supposed to be karma that he's the one that's being forced to sell apples in the cold, but still, that means she took him back. Again, I ask, why and how is this supposed to be a satisfying ending? Porky the Wrestler. Nothing great, but it has a few okay gags. The most memorable thing about it is that this is the first Looney Tunes cartoon to have Mel Blanc's voice in it, although he only contributed to some of Porky's sound effects rather than actually voicing a character. Pigs is Pigs. There is a real cruelty to this one that's really easy to appreciate. 
even if it does spend a little bit too much time on the setup, and the Nightmare itself doesn't really have much of a punchline. Porky's Road Race. This is another Looney Tunes cartoon that lampoons the celebrities of the era, and again, if you don't know who these people are, a lot of the jokes are probably going to fly over your head. Although, admittedly, the opening forward about how the characters in this cartoon clearly don't represent any real people is pretty funny. And once the race actually begins, there's a few good, solid gags, even if Porky does get kind of lost in the shuffle. Picador Porky. The first cartoon where Mel Blanc actually voices some characters beyond a few of Porky Pig's sound effects. It's got a good, solid plot and a few decent gags, like the Safety Zone gag, even if it does feel too stretched out in some parts. I only have eyes for you. Boy, crooners must have been a really big deal back in the 30s. Anyway, this is pretty tame Tex Avery work. Barely passable, but ultimately unremarkable. The Fellow with the Fiddle. Tells a good, solid story and even manages to work in a really cynical tone throughout most of it. Also, I have to give mad props to a cartoon that warns about the danger of being greedy while also taking a huge dump all over the IRS simultaneously. Porky's Romance. This was the final cartoon in which Porky Pig was voiced by his original voice actor Joe Doherty before being replaced by Mel Blanc in subsequent cartoons. This is probably the cruelest and most cynical Looney Tunes cartoon so far, in which the takeaway message is that if you feed your girlfriend chocolate in an attempt to woo her, when you eventually marry her, she'll get so fat that you'll have to do all the housework and child rearing yourself. Oh, and it also features Porky trying to commit suicide. Like I said, cynical, cruel, and actually pretty darn funny. She was an acrobat's daughter. Again, this is another one of those cartoons with celebrity caricatures and dated references that probably would have been really funny to those at the time, but nowadays just seems odd and bizarre. That being said, the boy duck that talks really quickly and won't shut up got a big laugh out of me, despite only appearing in the last two minutes. Porky's Duck Hunt This one is an important stepping stone for Looney Tunes. Not only is this Daffy Duck's first appearance, this is also Mel Blanc's first time voicing Porky Pig, a testing of the waters you could say to see if he could properly play their, at the time, biggest star. Aside from some disjointed pacing in some places, the drunk fish scene in particular comes out of nowhere. This one feels an awful lot like the kind of cartoons that Warner Brothers would be known for later on down the road. Zany, cynical, cruel, and not afraid to break the fourth wall. Ain't We Got Fun. We are starting to see a real mean and sadistic streak with these cartoons, and I'm all for it. Porky and Gabby. I like the horn gag. But aside from that, this one's mostly just kind of annoying, and although that might be due to the inclusion of a character called Gabby, a short-tempered goat that was clearly trying to be set up as a foil and partner for Pork Pig, but man, is he aggravating to watch. Clean Pastures. Number three in the Censored Eleven, and believe it or not, this one was controversial when it was first released. Oh, not because the characters are in blackface, but due to the ending gag of Satan entering heaven. There's a few decent gags in here. The pair O dice gag, for some reason, really made me laugh. And it has some good energy to it, but one of the angels is aggravatingly irritating to watch, and most of this cartoon isn't really much of anything. Uncle Tom's Bungalow. And we're immediately right back to another Censored Eleven. And this is the best one so far. It's certainly the most palatable so far, mostly due to the fact that this cartoon features black characters as unambiguously the good guys that we're supposed to root for, and the slave owner Simon Legree is clearly the bad guy. In fact, the decision to portray Legree as something akin to a used car salesman is actually really funny. As is the joke about Uncle Tom having sold his soul to Warner Brothers, which I'm amazed that they let them keep in. And the chasing near the end is a lot of fun too. Really, the biggest issue here is that the introduction just takes way too long. Porky's Building. The opening title scene is hilarious, as well as the step out folks you bother me gag. The plot's mostly an excuse to do some construction gags, and I'm okay with that. Streamlined gets green. There's something about the designs of this one where it tries to go for a cutesy look, but it ends up looking horrifying. 
either way, there's just not a lot of good gags in this one. At least until the ending, which is a combination of shockingly brutal and mean that I have to admit I didn't see coming. Sweet Sue. This one is primarily known for being the first instance of the merry-go-round broke down being used in a Warner Brothers short. That's pretty much the only noteworthy thing in this otherwise banal cartoon. The gags are just weak and sluggishly paced. Although the last Mohican gag is pretty amusing. Porky Super Service. This one is just really mean once it gets to Porky's fight with the baby. Mean, but also really funny. Egghead Rides Again. It is so bizarre to hear Daffy Duck's voice coming out of a human character. Anyway, this one's pretty weak for a Tex Avery cartoon. The gags just don't work. I don't know, the timing just feels off. Porky's Bad Time Story. Bob Clampett's first cartoon, and it's one that he would later remake only with Gabby replaced with Daffy Duck. But honestly, this one's really good all on its own. This might actually be the most relatable cartoon to the bunch so far, perfectly capturing what it feels like trying to get to bed early and just not being able to fall asleep. Plenty of Money and You. Starts off pretty weak, but it improves starting with the garden hose gag, and the climax with the weasel is a lot of fun. In particular, the fireworks gag is pure comedic inspiration. Porky's Railroad. This one's mostly just nice and pleasant, making the time go by, but without leaving too much of an impact. And thankfully, they don't recycle any of the train gags from the Harmon Ising era, probably due to having Frank Tashlin in the director's chair. A Sunbonnet Blue. Mostly bland, in no small part due to devoting way too much time to the singing mice. Get Rich Quick Porky. This one's just a lot of fun. From the dog trying to bury his bone, to the obvious but still wonderfully satisfying punchline about the field actually containing oil in it, this one tells a good, solid, well-developed plot and is actually funny to boot. Speaking of the weather, yet another one that feels pretty dated now due to the surplus of now outdated pop culture references. Like the others, it has its place as a historical artifact and does manage to work in a few halfway decent gags like the Life magazine joke, but unless you're really familiar with the 1930s pop cultural zeitgeist, I can't imagine this one having long-lasting appeal. Porky's Garden. I get the feeling that Tex Avery does better when working with Porky Pig than doing Merry Melodies, because when he's given free reign and not forced to include a musical number, his cartoons are creative and a ton of fun. Bonus points for the out-of-nowhere Popeye reference and the overly convoluted ending punchline that still got a big laugh out of me. Dog Days. It's a bunch of dog gags. Some of them work, some of them don't. Some of them are just so lazy that I had to give them a little bit of props for it. One shot looks bizarrely out of focus, although I don't know if it's a problem with the original short or if it's because the film negative was just so badly corroded. I want to be a sailor. The main character in this one is incredibly annoying. It doesn't even seem like it's trying to tell some decent jokes, and the story just isn't all that good. Rover's Rival. Wow, was this one a blast. The fast manic energy, the totally irredeemable puppy villain, the well-timed slapstick gags, and Rover the geezer dog is a great one-shot Looney Tunes character. It just made me laugh really consistently, and honestly, I can't ask for more of a cartoon than that. The Lion Mouse. An adaptation of The Lion and the Mouse. Which just goes to show that some stories are too bare bones to even qualify for a 7 minute short. But, it's got a few halfway decent gags out of it, including a funny idea for a punchline that could have been taken a step further and been even crueler. The Case of the Stuttering Pig. The atmosphere in this one is just masterful. The lighting, the music, the directing, the animation. It all does some incredible job at creating a genuinely chilling mood. This cartoon is a perfect mixture of unsettling and funny. The ending is a little weak, but otherwise, this is a classic and one that is absolutely perfect for the Halloween season. Little Red Walking Hood. I love how this cartoon uses both a pinball machine and billiards to try to establish a villainous characterization for the wolf. 
Anyway, this one is just a fun modern day retelling of Little Red Riding Hood. With the King's X gag and, most creatively, the gag involving the audience members blocking the screen that I'm sure would have been a real treat back in the 30s. Porky's Double Trouble. Ah, so this is where John Cherry got the idea for Ernest Goes to Jail. Anyway, lots of creative fast-moving gags in this one, and the ending where Petunia chooses the killer over Porky is hilarious. The Woods Are Full of Cuckoos. Oh look, another cartoon featuring caricatures of the era. And I'm pretty sure this one reuses animation from The Cuckoo Nut Grove. Admittedly, the use the books gag was good, but that's about it. Porky's Hero Agency. It's got some creative energy, but the gags just feel really lacking in this one. September in the Rain. This one is awfully short, not even clocking in at six minutes, which kind of makes me wonder why they even bothered with this one, because it's not really that funny or creative. Daffy Duck and Egghead. Ah, yes, the triumphant return of Daffy Duck, and the first instance of Egghead, often seen as a prototype of Elmer Fudd, being seen as a hunter. And while Tex Avery reuses the audience member blocking the screen gag, he actually takes it a step further this time around by having Egghead shoot him, which makes the joke even funnier. This also marks the first time the 10 paces gag was used in these cartoons. Also, I love the subtle joke of Egghead being able to hit the broad side of a barn. Honestly, this one is just a classic, through and through. Porky's Papa. This one contains a duck that looks like Daffy Duck, but this time he sounds like Donald Duck, so... That's something. Overall, there are a few visually creative gags here. The image of the debt being superimposed on Porky's father's back in particular is very well done. My Little Buckaroo. This one's got some great gags in it. The burglar alarm joke, the steed strike joke. Those are both great. I really could have done without the pig deputy's off-key singing in his intro, but this is otherwise a good solid chase cartoon. Porky at the Crocodero. It's okay. Some good gags, but the setup takes too long, and the reuse animation is really obvious here. Jungle Jitters. Oh joy, another Censored Eleven cartoon. Uh, this one's got some okay gags at the beginning, but certainly nothing to write home about. And the more it goes on, the less the cartoon tries to make the audience laugh. The traveling salesman's voice is annoying, and I was actually rooting for the tribe to eat him. What Price Porky? This is another really fun outing. It's got that great anarcho-chaotic energy that we associate with Looney Tunes, as well as some really violent images. I know that Tex Avery's tenure from this area is praised for bringing energy and life to the Looney Tunes, and rightfully so, but I don't think Bob Clampett gets enough praise for his early cartoons. The Sneezing Weasel even in Tex Avery's lesser cartoons, he still manages to work in some great gags, like the scram gag and the counting machine gag. Porky's Phony Express. This is another one where the timing of the whole thing just feels off. It doesn't even feel like it's trying to have good gags, and the animation feels too wonky. A Star is Hatched. Boy, the creators are getting their fill of W.C. Fields jokes, aren't they? It's another one of those where the gags just don't land, and it's probably because it's another one that relies on understanding 30s pop culture. Although the ending punchline is the right amount of cruel. Porky's 5 and 10. Why even bother putting Porky's name in the title when he's barely in the thing? It's mostly uninspired fish gags. I did like the typewriter gag, but otherwise this one just kind of exists. The Penguin Parade. If you like penguins, you'll probably enjoy this one, which is otherwise pretty standard. It's still a thousand times better than Happy Feet, though. Porky's Hare Hunt. Porky goes on a rabbit hunt where he goes up against a prototype of Bugs Bunny. The rabbit here is actually much closer in personality to the original Daffy Duck, down to basically having the same voice, except for his laugh, which is basically Woody Woodpecker's laugh. This one's interesting from a historical context when viewed as Warner Brothers still trying to find their groove, but as an actual short, it's a little lacking. Now that summer is gone. I've always had a soft spot for this one, and I can't really explain why. 
and I'm probably the only one who likes it this much. Maybe it's the fact that this cartoon contrasts the cutesy Disney style with a deeply cynical story of a young squirrel who literally gambles his family's winter supply away, and then by the end still hasn't learned his lesson. Some of the reused animation is too obvious, but this is otherwise a real treat. Engine Trouble. I actually had to check and see if I had seen this one before, because parts of it felt really familiar. But no, it turns out that this cartoon actually had a color remake made seven years after this called Wagon Heels. So that was confusing. Anyway, this one's got a few creative gags, and its portrayal of Native Americans is actually one of the tamer ones of the era. I wouldn't call this great, but it's perfectly serviceable. Alright, that's 200 down. We still have 800 left to go. This collection of Looney Tunes cartoons was extremely interesting. The ones in the previous 100 were mostly just banal and pretty consistently mediocre. But here there's been improvement in some areas. The gags are far more outlandish, they're getting a lot more cynical compared to the bouncy Disney ripoffs they'd once been, and they finally found their first genuine breakout character with Porky Pig. They're also leaning more heavily into pop cultural references, which just goes to show they're not afraid to make their cartoons more contemporary rather than the more timeless feel that Disney was going for at the time. But at the same time, that means some of their cartoons have aged poorly and not just because of the outdated racial stereotypes. But still, this was a very interesting transition period, which I think we can attribute to Tex Avery, Frank Tashlin, and Bob Clampett being brought in as directors. Guys that all have different styles in the kinds of cartoons they make, including jokes, pacing, style, and mood, that will help shape the future landscape of Looney Tunes. We'll probably continue to see the same experimentation in the next hundred cartoons as we leave the 30s behind and head into the 1940s especially as they promote one of their animators to the director's chair by the name of Chuck Jones. It'll be very interesting to watch his early cartoons. We'll continue to see more of Porky Pig, a lot more of Daffy Duck, and the official introduction of Elmer Fudd, and, at the back end, the introduction of a certain rabbit that's going to take this company by storm. And, I guess that's it for now. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to be notified of when part 3 comes out, make sure you subscribe so that you don't miss it. Anyway, have a good day, and I'll see you next time.